Right, let's get started. Um, well, thanks for coming out and choosing my talk. And uh, there's, there's competition, I'm aware. So thank you for your time and interest in what I, I hope is a, a useful talk. Um, so as you can all read, I, I'm here to talk about X509 client authentication in, in Zephyr. Um, so just as, as a quick introduction, um, my name is Kevin Townsend. I'm the tech lead at Light. Some of you may or may not be familiar with Lenaro. We've been involved with Zephyr for, for quite a number of years. Um, I think to an extent you can blame us for device tree, for example, <laughs> if, that's, if that's new to you. And um, So I, I wanted, before I, get, I dive into this, I wanted to, to also give some credit to, to my colleague here, David Brown, who was um, a big technical help, I think, on, on a lot of the, the issues that we're, we're, we're gonna discuss here, while I'm just involving generally authentication and, and X509 certificate management on, on Zephyr. So, um, Appreciate uh, as uh, as always his his uh, security and technical expertise. Um, so what are we going to talk about here? Just to give a, a sense, um, uh, you can see the agenda here. Basically, what do we what do we mean by X509 client authentication? Usually, we hear X509, we think about TLS servers, and ensuring that we're talking to the server we think we are. So what does that what does client authentication mean? Why would I bother with that? And then just going through some some specific implementation steps of what that might look like. So what do we mean by X509 client authentication? So this is this is something you're probably, everybody here is familiar with. Um, I have my client device, I have a socket connection, I wanna talk over HTTPS or whatever else to some server that, that's using TLS. So what that usually looks like is you're gonna have a client device, whether that's your embedded device or your, your laptop or your phone or whatever, that client device will have a certificate from the certificate authority. And basically the, what that does is, is, is that client is going to send a request to the server. It's going to start a TLS handshake. And part of that handshake is the client saying, okay, who are you on the other end? And what are you gonna to do to prove that, who you are? So the, you send the client hello and the client or the server is going to send back a server hello. And part of that is that it's going to send back a server certificate. And that certificate that the server that provides is, is uh, signed by a certificate authority. And you trust the server because you trust that certificate authority and the CA certificate on your client device gives you the means to verify the certificate that's coming back, which is, which is signed uh, cryptographically. So that, that's, that's sort of a familiar process. Um, so what do we mean by client? Um, authentication specifically, or, or sometimes the, the word that you see uh, if you dig around on the internet is mutual TLS. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to highlight that mutual TLS, there's, there's nothing special about mutual TLS. This isn't some extension to the TLS spec. This isn't some new fancy thing. This has always been part of the core TLS spec. It's just that it, it tends not to get used very much. Um, but there's any, any sort of standard TLS stack that you're using will support this. There's, there's, there's no fancy secret sauce. There's, there's no special IP here. So what does this mean, sort of mutual TLS? Um, and there's not, I don't think there's really an official word for it. So just, but mutual TLS tends to be what you'll, you'll get the best Google results for. So what does that mean? We've got the same scenario of the client initiates the, conver the sort of this conversation with the server. The server has in part the same server hello response. It's gonna send back its X509 certificate signed by the CA um, and then the client device is going to verify that certificate that comes back thanks to the CA certificate that it has. What mutual TLS does is it takes that one step further. So the client is saying, hey, I don't know, you, you, you seem kind of suspicious so, as a server. Do I actually trust you? I verify that. The server then does the same thing and says, hey, I don't know who you are. Um, can you prove to me that you're actually the device that, 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 that you think you are and, and demonstrate that I'm talking to a reliable partner on your side as well? And so what happens is that same process, the server is going to request the client to send back an X509 uh, certificate that is also signed by a CA, and the server will have a copy of these, the certificate authority or certificate authorities. You, you, you can have sort of multiple levels um, in, in, your, in your certificate chain, and the server can have maybe, if you have an OEM provider, et cetera, or several OEM partners, you can have several certificates that can be signed um, by some, somewhere in that, uh, that certificate chain. And the server will, will have the means to verify the client devices that are also sending back a certificate. Um, and then that will, uh, in an ideal world, you'll also verify that with maybe a certificate authority on, on some REST, over some REST API, et cetera. So that, that's sort of the difference between sort of 
standard typical TLS and what we're referring to here as mutual TLS. So the question then is what does this have to do with authentication? This ensures to a certain extent that we're talking to a trusted party, but I don't necessarily know who that party is specifically. And so why we use the word authentic client authentication is we can use part of that um, TLS handshake process where there's certificates on both sides to also inject identifiable information into that client certificate so that not only do I know I can trust this client device, but I can know specifically exactly who this device is and that that, 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 that information can easily be tampered with because when that client device got its certificate with this identifiable information that was signed by the CEA and, and there's a hash in the signature so that we we're, 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 we have a reasonable degree of confidence that that information isn't being tampered with. So that's basically what, what we mean by X5 on client authentication is basically trying to address the authentication and trust problems based on a standard mechanism, which is X509 certificates and, and, and sort of shared secrets and no exchange of passwords. So that comes to the question is this, this why would we bother with, with this approach? Well, the first thing is, um, of course, that it's that, that it, there's, there's a number of advantages of doing this authentication and trust verification based on public key cryptography. There are no more passwords with, with this approach is, is one of the biggest sort of benefits here. I don't have to keep a list of passwords on my server. I don't have to worry about how are those, the, the, those passwords being uh, stored on the server or transmitted or, or verified, et cetera. Um, that, that sort of password management problem disappears when, when we're doing authentication like this. Um, and there, there's, there's a number of just security advantages to this specifically. Uh, the, the private keys that are associated with those X509 certificates are much easier at least with, with modern um, embedded systems, like anything based on an ARM V8M, for example, you have ARM Trust Zone and, and software frameworks like Trusted Firmware M that allow you to, with a high degree of confidence, isolate those private keys inside a secure enclave. So that maybe your untrusted firmware, which might be Zephyr, or Zephyr RTOS talking to TFM or something like that, that private key data never has to be exposed to your less trusted par part of your firmware. So there, there, there's, there's a significantly um, reduced attack surface if you're trying to compromise the, 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 the private key credentials or those can go in a secure enclave. There's a lot of partition op, partitioning options here for, but that um, isolating that private key is much easier in, um, than if you, you're, you're just, your provisioning involves sending a password off to some device or that device generating that password and how do we store that, et cetera. Um, some of the other advantages are this, 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 if you can isolate this private key based that on, on, on some sort of cryptographic or secure enclave that's, that's maybe in, in, in a hardware device, you can bind that, that, that identity to a very specific chip. So not just a board, but to a specific instance of an IC. So I can't just pull that IC out and put a new IC in. That certificate and that authentication, we can bind that very tightly to a very specific instance of, of not just the board, but, a, but an MCU. So you, you, you really significantly reduce the opportunities to pretend that you're another trusted device, whereas with a, with, with a password, that's, that might be relatively trivial. Um, so it, it, this, generally, this, this approach gives us a very high level of confidence in, on, on both sides of the communication, who we're, that, that we know who we're talking to, and we have a degree of confidence that this is a trusted device. And unlike passwords, um, you, it's, there, there, there's a lot less risk of, of sort of device compromise, uh, devices being compromised. Um, one of the other advantages of, of sort of this, this approach of using a CA as your common, I don't want to say root of trust, but sort of the, well, yeah, the, the, the by, by having an external trusted party that is vouching for the, 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 the authenticity of, of, of both the client and the server, is that um, it, it makes the maintenance of, of your devices, on, on the one hand, a little bit more complex because this involves more infrastructure. That's one of the trade-offs of using X509 for authentication is it does require more infrastructure and more planning, but it also um, allows you to offload the device uh, authentication sort of workflow. For example, if I know a device was stolen, I have an employee or I have an employee that left the company, um, we, we, can, we can have sort of a central management system so that it's relatively easy as that, that, that employee is sort of offboarded to revoke that certificate. Um, and then ideally you'll have a verification system in place that as the server gets a new request from a client device, it can look at this, this centralized uh, 
certificate management system to say, okay, well, this device, maybe the CA, uh, maybe it's signed by the CA, but you have means to, to reject that certificate down the road. Um, and another benefit is, of course, passwords. Maybe, maybe they can live on forever and ever. One of the advantages of X509 certificates for authentication is that in a worst case scenario, certificates have a lifetime. So I can, I can generate, um, there's a trade-off between sort of performance and or just sort of maintenance burden, but potentially I can be generating a new certificate every month, day, week, year, every 10 years, but you can assign a lifetime to that. So in the worst case, that a certificate is compromised, there, at least the, the, there are some controls over how, how long that potential threat can exist in the wild. Um, and at worst, if you know something was completely compromised, you, see, you, you, you can just change the certificate authority on the server and then all of those devices where the key was compromised, those, those certificates will be rejected um, as, as they try to connect to the server and you'll have to go through provisioning again. So there, there are trade-offs here, but um, so that, that's just some of the, the, the benefits of looking at sort of X509 specifically for authentication. So uh, let's, let's sort of just go through what, what does this look like? Um, just a, as an example of sort of certificate generation. And there are three parts to this. There's the certificate authority, there's your server certificate, and there's, there's a client certificate. And this is a certificate, and this is a bit of a, an artificial example because I'm basically just going to be, be using OpenSSL to show how we generate this, the, the, the sort of the various certificates and certificate signing requests, et cetera, here. The reason is just to demonstrate the concepts. Obviously, in a real device, you're, you're going to want to be using, say, embed TLS to generate your certificate signing requests, and, and embed TLS has support for that. So this just this is really just to sort of demonstrate the the concepts at a technical level. So the first thing you want to you're, you're going to want to do is, is obviously generate your certificate authority um, key and associate a certificate with that key, and the certificate is going to take, going to contain the public key, and that's something you can sort of freely share and use that to verify um, signatures on, on on the client device or or on the server. Um, so you can see here sort of just some standard commands. This first one will generate your private key. You obviously want to store that somewhere safe, or maybe that's generated by some sort of uh, crypto device or, or held in a secure enclave, et cetera. You, that, that's sort of the one thing that you really want to be careful to protect because if, you, if this is compromised, everything falls apart. There, there has to be some root of trust somewhere. Um, so this will generate a, a new private key for us. And then from that, we can use OpenSSL to generate a X509 certificate based on that key. And there's a lot of little details here to get right. And there's a lot of bad information on the internet and don't trust something on Stack Overflow saying this is how you generate your certificates and your keys and, and, and verify signatures because there's a lot of bad information out there. Um, and, and again, this is where I, I'm happy to have someone like David on my, on my team sort of just to to, to, to have a, a reasonable degree of, of expertise in, in this field to, to sort of point out some, some of the common problems. Um, so the, in this case, there's, um, you're going to generate your, your X509 certificate based on this private key. And there's a few important values that um, specifically the, the, the subject line is you, you'll see as we sort of go through this how that it's, um, it's important to be able to sort of trace um, well, you'll see how this fits into to sort of authentication later. Um, so this this will give us our private key and our certificate. And if you want, you can use this open SSL command to sort of spit out in, in, a, in a friendly way what that certificate contains. So the next part of the equation then is, is our server. We need to now generate a private key for our server. And unlike the CA where we basically have a self-signed certificate, the way that this works is the certificate authority acts as a, a guarantor of, of the uh, of, of sort of certificates further down the, the, the food chain. So what happens is we generate exactly the same way, a new private key for our TLS server. And again, you want to store that in some sort of secure enclave or, or, or somewhere that um, isn't easily compromised. And But what we do in this case is we generate something called a certificate signing request. And that certificate signing request um, basically contains uh, information about the server or later about your client device and you send that up to the to to the certificate authority and the certificate authority takes that information hashes it uh, signs it and then gives you back a certificate in a way that um, the the information on about the certificate authority is embedded into that 
um, that uh, server certificate. What's important here is again the subject line um, that that server certificate that you're generating is tied to a specific server or to a specific device. So it's very important that the CN field here in the subject line, uh, the the common name, that has to match the the server that you're talking to. So maybe that's example dot or sort of example.me.com or so, or test.lenaro.org. Um, if the common name here doesn't match the server that you're talking to, then that will be, the, the request will be rejected. So there's little details like this that are very important. You, you need to know where this certificate is being deployed. Um, so the, the next, so, so generating that, that, that CSR, um, how does that happen is, you can do this with open SSL or you can do this with embed TLS. But in the case of the, the uh, server, we need to limit, sort of basically define some limitations on, on what the certificate can do. Otherwise, um, we, 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 we could use, um, we could say, for example, where we want to say, for example, that the certificate is not a CA and that it can only be used for, uh, for digital signatures or server authentication. And again, um, you, you need to tie the, the DNS record to the the actual domain that you're using, so which is, here is localhost, but that, that can be again whatever your your domain is going to be. So you need to basically limit the scope of um, as, as just as a best practice of of what that, uh, that that server certificate can do. So we'll dump all of these into into a, just a, a server dot extension file, and then we we we're going to request a certificate signing request to be generated with OpenSSL. Say. Um, the hashing algorithm, et cetera, create a new serial number for that. And you'll end up with something called server CSR. Um, or sorry, and, and this actually, this, sorry, my mistake. This will actually send, this, this command will actually send the CSR uh, to, to, to be signed by using this, the CA certificate here in, in this case. Normally you would have an actual CA server um, that you would send this to and, and you would have a database behind that where all the, that information is being logged. And we'll get back uh, our X509 certificate. And so if you look at that certificate here, you'll see, for example, here's our subject line with the domain name. We can see the parent authority, which is the root CA, which is to say, what is the certificate authority vouching to the, to, to, to the authenticity of this, of this server? And then some of the extensions that we've signed, that, that we sent in, so that this is not a certificate authority, that the key can be used for digital signatures only, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, the subject alternate uh, name just uh, for which will be our, our domain. So that brings us to the third, the third key in this uh, sort of triangle, uh, which is our device key. And again, normally this is something that would happen on your Zephyr device specifically, but just for, for sort of test and demonstration purposes, uh, if you're playing around with this on the shell, we can generate that device key and certificate signing request very similarly. Um, using OpenSSL. So again, we generate a new private key. Uh, and this is where the authentication part comes in. We need to set, it's, it's a requirement for X509 certificates that every certificate has a unique subject line. Um, and we can use that to our advantage uh, by injecting some sort of identifiable information into that subject line in the form of the, the common name. So in this case, what, what we're doing just as an example is we're, we're gonna generate a, a UUID for a device ID, and then we're going to inject that into the, into the CN field of the subject line. And then what that enables us to do is then when we send a request from the client device to our server, we can extract that UUID. And then I know exactly, not just that I'm talking to a trusted device, but I know exactly which trusted device I'm talking to. Um, and so you can see here that when we generate our CSR, we're, we're passing in a subject line to say what is our organization and then the common name will be our UUID and it's optional but if you want to specify other information like the organizational unit etc maybe you have multiple certificates on your device and you need to differentiate um, this is the Azure IoT hub certificate and maybe you have multiple services where e each one has a key you can use something like the organizational unit for example to differentiate those um, and then, so we will send that CSR to, to our CA. And again, we'll get back a certificate that is signed with, with the CA uh, private key. Um, and you can similarly look, look at that, uh, that certificate output if you want. If you want, you can see the subject line here, for example, Lenaro. 
the com as the org, the common name, and we have our UUID and then the optional organizational unit to differentiate certificates. Um, and so none of none of this sort of matches what a, what a typical provisioning workflow would look like with with real devices. But just to demonstrate how this might work in Zephyr, we can take those uh, certificate outputs and convert those into something that's more C friendly that we can embed in our demo later. So just as as as, as a a sort of a useful pointer. Assume we we run these commands, and I'm going to get three text files out. So my CA certificate, my device certificate, and then my device private key. And those are the 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 three pieces of information that we need on our client uh, devices, uh, our Zephyr based devices, uh, to make this work. So if you really if you wanted to see just a simple Bash script um, that will generate all of these certificates for you, including the C friendly outlets, so you can just have a look at this this URL at the bottom, or or scan this QR code, and that'll give you a Bash script that will generate all of those um, artifacts for you. So the next part of the puzzle then is um, in, before we can think about sending, authenticating a client device based on Zephyr, we need something to talk to. So what does a mutual TLS TCP server look like? And again, here's here's an example. Uh, this this is written in Go. But this is just a very bare bones um, TCP server with TLS mutual authentication, just to demonstrate what this might look like on the receiving end of your server to have something to talk to. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a there's a couple just sort of key lines of code. There's there's nothing particularly complicated again because this is a standard part of TLS. Um, so there's there, there's no real fancy additions required. So the the, the most important thing is obviously. We're starting up our server. We need to say the server uses this particular server certificate and server, server private key. Any sort of TLS connection, even if it's not mutual, we'll need that. We need to create a certificate pool with the certificate authority. And this is where the mutual TLS comes in because normally you don't have to worry about the CA on the server side. But in this case, we need to also pass the certificate authority certificate into our server so that it can verify the client devices. So in, in, in Go in particular, that would happen with, with something called a, a an X509 certificate pool. So we're loading the CA certificate that we've generated with our Bash script, and then we, 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 we append that into the pool. And so what happens is we, we need to pass in a TLS config to Go. And the difference here is th these first two lines are very standard. We're just saying we want to use at least TLS 1.2, which is generally very good practice anyway. These are the certificates that, that we're using, which is our server, server certificate and our server public key. And the important lines are these next three, where I'm saying I also care about client authentication. And I want TLS, the TLS stack, to also require and verify the client certificate. So this, this is sort of the part of the process, because it's actually the server that decides whether client authentication happens or not. Obviously, we don't want to let the client devices decide that for us. So the server is saying, well, okay, I also want to want to verify what's coming in. So in the case of, of, of Go's TLS stack, um, we, we, we request that here. And I also give it my certificate pool, which is where I have the CA or CA certificates that are going to verify the client requests coming in. And, and again, that can be multiple CAs or um, depending, or we can have one common CA at the top. And you can have a variety of intermediate certi intermediary st certificates for OEMs or more or less trusted providers, or maybe I'm working with NXP, ST, and Nordic, and I'm going to give each of them their own intermediate certificates so that um, that are signed by the CA. So I can still validate those individually with the top level CA, but they can't pretend to be an ST device or a Nordic device or an NXP device because they're using an intermediary certificate. Um, and then finally, the, 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 the other sort of final request is, um, this, there's an optional callback you can say called verify peer certificate. And we're passing in a function here called validate peer. And what that's going to do is that, that's going to give us an opportunity to do additional verification on the requests that come in. So by default, the TLS stack is going to check for two things. It's going to check that the client device um, has been signed with the CA that we're expecting. And it's going to check the validity date on, on those that the certificate isn't expired. That's not enough in the real world, obviously. You're going to want to do additional checks. Like maybe I want to actually check a database and see, has the certificate been revoked? Has this device been stolen? Has this device been deprovisioned? So this validate peer is, is your opportunity 
to, to do additional verification work. Oops, too, too quick on the draw. Um, so then the next step is just, we, we just start listening for connections. So there's just some simple logging here, but basically I'm just listening on a standard port, uh, 8443, and I start to, uh, I start to accept connect connections and then I offload every connection request that comes in with to, to the handle connection call. Um, and here we can see just the handle connections. So this will do some basic um, validation again on the, 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 the CA signature and the, the expiration date of the certificate. Oh crap. <laughs> um, so you can, yeah, you, you, you can see um, parsing the, 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 the peer certificates here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to skip through these. To... So what does this mean in, in, in TLS specifically? This is actually, it's actually very easy to, to enable all of these things in Zephyr. So basically, Zephyr's TLS stack works on something, uh, the terminology they use is a credential. And there's five types of credentials, a CA certificate, a server certificate, a private key, and then some pre-shared keys. The ones that we care about are, are these first three. So we have to... Uh, First, we, 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 can, we can take those C files that we generated, which is my device private key, my device certificate, and my CA, and I need to get those into Zephyr. So this, this sort of bit of code will take those text files and compile those into our, our Zephyr sample. And you need to define something called a tag list in, in Zephyr, sort of based on their TLS stack. A tag list is a group of credentials where you can have up to one of each of those five types of credentials. So that might be for the C, for the, for the device certificate, That'll be my private key and my device certificate might be one tag list. You might have another tag list for the certificate authority where we just have our CA certificate. We associate our tag lists with those C payloads that we've converted. So we, we associate the, the tag list with uh, our, our, um, our device tag list with the private key and the certificate and, and um, assign those to, to the two tag lists we've defined here. And then what happens is when we, we start to set up, uh, when we start to set up our, our, our socket, which all of this is just sort of normal code that, that you're used to if you played with the socket API. Again, we say we want TLS 1.2. We want to go to localhost. And again, that localhost is important because that has to match the, the domain of um, test.linaro.org or whatever that the, the, the server certificate we generated is. And what's important is the, 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 the Zephyr's socket um, options that we set, where we're going to say, for example, here, TLS peer verify. And what that's going to do is that's going to ensure that the Zephyr stack is verifying the server certificate that, that it comes in. And if you don't add that as a minimum, as a starting point, then we don't even know who we're talking to on, uh, on the server side. So it's very important to, to remember first that you have to explicitly request the Zephyr's TLS stack to verify the, the signature of the server certificate. Um, and then what we do is we set the tag list for our socket connection, which contains the, 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 the private key, the device certificate, and the CA certificate. We'll associate those with this specific socket connection. Um, and that, that's, that's basically all, that, all that's required in the sense, um, because the server is actually doing most of the work in this exchange. So really all you have to do uh, on, the, on the Zephyr device, uh, device side um, to get X509 based, based uh, authentication is simply uh, enabling this this tag list and passing it in. Now, none of this is is, is, is sort of a, a real world example in a sense. You're going to want to do additional verification than just the CA signature and, and the date range. Um, and usually, how that happens is every certificate that you generate necessarily has a unique serial number. And so when I get a request on my server, I'm going to take that serial number, I'm going to go to my CA, and I'm going to say, okay, is this serial number valid? Um, has this been revoked, et cetera? So there's, there's more work required here, but um, generally the, the, um, that, that, that's going to depend on your, your sort of the, the constraints that you have uh, in, in your specific implementation. There's a few other sort of important details here that are worth considering. Storing private keys the way that we demonstrated here is a terrible practice, and you don't want to do that. Generally, you, you want to be generating your private keys in a way that that only happens in a secure enclave or that that private information is never exposed. One of the, one of the ways that we, we do this in Lenaro is, for example, we use um, a, a key derivation function. So most MCUs today, they have a, a unique hardware, a, a hardware unique key that's burned in at the factory or et cetera, and you can't uh, easily impersonate that. So this is what gives us 
device bound authentication by taking that huck plus um, some sort of information label we can derive one or more private keys based on, on on a value that's that's tied to a specific instance of an mcu and that allows us not just to generate device bound private keys but we don't have to store those keys so if my device if somebody can can get access to the flash memory on my device they can't pull out that private key because we're not storing it anywhere it's based on a secret that's buried deep within the device that you have no easy access to so just as sort of a best practice there, there's a lot of things that aren't represented in this bare bones example we've talked about but a common approach um, would, would be more like like this for your, for your key derivation so this is just one 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 very small piece of a puzzle of, of we we're, we're, we've been looking in Lenaro at sort of what does end to end security look like from secure boot all the way to cloud. So we we have something here called Lenaro CA, which is our basically it, it's a go um, it's a go certificate authority plus a database plus a REST API where we can demonstrate I pass in the, cert, the serial number for my, for my certificate I can verify that exists that that exists and and. The, the certificates are actually generated um, using embed TLS here in, in this bootstrap management system, which um, is on the non-secure side. And we use trusted firmware M to have sort of a secure and non-secure uh, partition in the system. And so this, yeah, uh, if, if you're interested in, in sort of how this fits into a bigger picture, um, I'll be presenting in two weeks at Embedded World, sort of this confidential AI approach where this is one small piece of it, but I wanted to demonstrate Sort of this idea of x509 based authentication because this applies i think potentially to a lot of of situations and, and and can solve a lot of authentication problems maybe there's a bit more work with this approach but it gives you a far more robust device bound storage free solution to have a high level of confidence in the devices you're talking to using existing open standards and, and norms that are supported by virtually any tls stack that, that's out there today um, so sorry, I, I ran I ran out of time. I'm terrible at this timing thing, but <laughs> I think before more people come in, if there's any questions or concerns, comments, yes. Very good. Uh, overall, I very new to that first side. Has anybody really talked about like hardware security modules for like HSM, like for separate? I know what you're talking about was basically one of the challenges of like securing a private key. And I mean, I know there's arm trust zone and other things, but I mean, it's, it's the sometimes you need to buy these chips where at the factory or somewhere secure, the private keys are actually you know put onto the hardware security module or you get a secure manifest file of certificates on the back end. I just didn't know if anybody has talked about support for that within Zephyr. It's, it, it's something that there's ongoing conversations in general. Um, if you're interested in this, you should join the security working group calls, which are every Monday. We're actively discussing, for example, the adoption of the PSA crypto API. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're open, yeah. We're discussing adopting the PSA crypto API as sort of the standard crypto API <laughs> yeah. um, for Zephyr. And part of that is that does bring into it bring in sort of an API for drivers for offloading um, storage of secure secrets and crypto elements, et cetera. So it's, it's, there's definitely an active discussion. If you're using an ARM V8 um, device, Zephyr has excellent in integration with TFM and TFM brings in protected storage, internal trusted storage, the ability to offload to secure elements, um, not just not just storage, but secret gener. I guess, I mean, it's... hold on, Tom, if you want to start getting set up, I'll just start asking questions. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh...